John 9, as Armin said, I was doing John 8 a couple of weeks ago. I just want to do a quick review because John 7, 8, and 9 are kind of like they go together and it's comprehend, concentrate, and consider. Those are the titles that I give to each of them. John 7 was about comprehension. You got to comprehend. And from John 7, what we learned was you've got to learn from the mistakes of other people or else you're going to repeat them learn from the mistakes of others. And in chapter seven, we saw, don't follow the multitude. That's what his brothers were doing. You gotta learn to follow Christ. Don't fear authorities. That's what the people were doing. They feared the Jews. You have to fear God. And then don't focus on the messenger. Focus on the message. That's what the Jews were doing. They were focused on the messenger and they were trying to destroy Jesus. So you gotta learn from the mistakes of others. And if you're struggling, learn to ask, seek, and knock. Ask for a relationship with Christ. Seek wisdom, which it, which begins with the fear of God. And then uh, knock. Knock for understanding of God's word. Go to God. So that's comprehend. Chapter 8 is concentrate. Concentrate on how you're going to live from this day forward. And it's going to take concentration. Every day, you got to concentrate. you got to focus. Right. And what Jesus was teaching in John chapter eight is follow me, follow Christ. I am the life of the uh, I am the light of the of life, because if you don't concentrate, think about this. If you don't follow Christ, you, if you want to follow your desires, you go right in. You go right back into a world of darkness. Follow Christ, abide in his word and be free from sin or abide in the lies and be a slave to sin. Keep his word, achieve and achieve eternal life, or keep absolutely nothing and achieve eternal destruction. So John chapter 8 was all about follow Christ, abide in his word, keep his word. And it takes concentration. You got to think about that. Today's lesson, John chapter 9, is consider. And this is kind of interesting because I think it kind of goes along with the class that we've had this morning from Brother James, and that is consider how you're going to treat people in this world and you really have to think about how you treat people right and I, I read this article and the person was saying there's three ways you can treat people or three ways you look at people the first one the three are um you look up to people you look up to people with envy you put them on a pedestal that's what the Jews were doing to Jesus. They were looking up at him with for envy because of the crowds, because of the miracles. But when you look up to people with envy, then you attack to destroy. Because you don't want anybody higher than you. You want to bring them down to your level. And then the other one was you look down at people. You look down at people with disdain. That's how the Jews look down at the blind man in this text. They look down at him with disdain so that they can disregard then walk away. We like to put people down. That's why uh, there's so many TV shows that just loves to put people down. All your soapbox operas in the afternoons, you know, you just like to see other people sinning worse than you. That makes you feel, right? You put people down, it builds you up. If people are above you, you tear them down, which builds you up. That's the way of the world. And what the lesson here, what Jesus is teaching is, you don't look up at people and you don't look down at people, you look across. You look across at people with compassion. And that's how, what you'll see with Jesus and the blind man. As a matter of fact, if I get a chance, that's what we see with the blind man and the Jews, I believe. You look across to them so that you reach out and you lend a hand and that you can help them. So it's three different ways of looking at people, and that's what we see in the text here. As a matter of fact, if you go back to, where am I? I'm in John chapter 9, but if you go back to John chapter 8, the last two verses, 58 and 59, here we have the, G, the Jews looking up to, at Jesus. They're looking up with that envy, right? They want to tear him down. So, so Jesus says to them in verse 58, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. He's, he's saying, I'm God is what he's saying. Therefore, 
because of their envy. They picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. All through John, from about chapter 5, they, they want to kill him because of all the great things he's doing, his teachings, his miracles, the crowds, totally envious. And when we can't destroy you, we're going to kill you, right? They're looking down at Jesus. And then to begin this chapter, now we've got, as he's passed by, as he's walking along, he sees a man blind from birth. And you have to think that he must have stopped. And then the disciple said, Rabbi, teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Now, this is an interesting statement made by the disciples. They're looking down at the man born blind, right? They're looking down and they're trying to explain why he's suffering. They're not trying to help him get out of his suffering. They're looking down and saying, oh, you know, he's that way because of sin. Well, so who sinned, his parents or him? And that's a way people today, they, you know, we're all guilty of looking down and not, oh, well, he deserves it, right? Oh, well, that's why, because they brought it upon, and what Jesus is saying, no, no, don't be looking down at people. Don't be looking in the past, look in the present. What can you do? What Jesus does is he looks across. He looks into, he looks into this, this man's eyes, though the man can't see back. And Jesus says, it's, it's neither this man's sin, nor his parents, but it was so the works of God can be displayed in him. It's an opportunity for us. So we don't try to analyze the cause. We work on the solution. And the solution is bringing them Christ. Well, and here's Christ. He can he can heal him totally. This is interesting. I've always struggled with this one. We must work the works of him who sent me. As long as it is day, night is coming when no one can work. And while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Night is coming. So is he referring to Jesus' death? And if you look at Jesus' death, afterwards, he doesn't do miracles. He presents himself, but he doesn't continue healing people. But he pours out the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and people are doing miracles. So if you look at the idea that night is coming, right, when no one can work, he's referring to your personal death. As long as you're alive here, you can accomplish great things. But when you die, so your time is limited. Jesus' time was limited. So let's do the works that we can while we can. And I, I kind of jumped to Luke chapter 16 to get a really neat idea on, on what I'm trying to bring out with this section here. And that's the rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man has all this opportunity while he's alive to serve Lazarus, but he doesn't help at all. And then when he dies, he realizes, because when you die, it's not like you're in the grave sound asleep until judgment day. You know, he's in Hades and he realizes what he's done to himself and he wants to change. He wants to help. Where am I looking for? 27. He's talking to Abraham and he says, well, then I beg you, Father Abraham, that you send Lazarus to my father's house. For I have five brothers in order that he may warn them so they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, well, they've got Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He said, no, but if someone comes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded. Even if someone rises from the dead, he had an opportunity, but now it was night. And now he has no opportunity to help others. While it is still day, while you're still alive, this is when you have the opportunity because there's going to be coming a time when you're going to say, I, I could have, I should have done something. 
But I was busy looking up to people to tear down or I was busy looking down at people to walk away from people. I wasn't busy looking across at people. And this is kind of interesting, this across, because when you look at Hades, and when you die, you go to heaven, not to Hades. But when you look at this concept of Hades, the people in Hades could look across the chasm. And Abraham says, this is a chasm that no one can cross. They can't come over to us. We can't go over to them. And I thought about that. We can't go to them because when the people are in, in the reward, they want to go help the people that are suffering. They want to go help family members. But what he's saying is, no, it's night. That opportunity that you had while you were alive, that opportunity, it's gone. Okay? And then what does Jesus say? Ah, while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, because he dies doesn't mean he's no longer in the world because he comes and lives within us as the Holy Spirit. And what we need to realize, we are the light of the world. We have the spirit of God living within us. And, and that's what Jesus is talking to us about, I believe, in Matthew chapter 5. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So I'm trying to live a life so people can see that I'm pouring out love. That's good works into the lives of other people. While it's still day for me, I got to do the works of my father. Right? And as long as people in this world are doing those good works, Christ's light continues to shine. Because that's what he was saying back in chapter 8. Follow me. I am the light of life. You want life? Get me inside of you. That's what Christ is saying. That's what we need to, that's what we need to consider, right? How, how am I looking at other people? And when he had said this, verse 6, back to John 9, he spat on the ground, made clay, and applied it to his eyes and said, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went away, washed, came back seeing. That is such a simple little verse right there, verse, verse 7. Consider it. This blind man, Jesus spits on the ground, makes the, makes the clay, okay? So that's kind of insulting. So, But, you know, I want to see. And then he smears this guy's face with this mud, this clay, and says, go cross town, which will take him an hour or two, right, to find this pool, wash and that's all he says right he doesn't say you know you 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 know go wash in the pool of Siloam. he's not saying you're going to be able to see so this blind man's got to spend however much time and all these people ridiculing him because he's got mud all over his face and he's got to ask the way am i am i you know so he's got to stop he's got to grab people and they're going to look at him and he's got this all over his face so he's got to be praying to God that whole way. He's humbled himself and he's going all the way to get to that pool to wash so he can see. I mean, the thoughts that are going around, you know, and I, I kind of put it in the same perspective as, as Paul. When Paul was blind for three days, he sat in prayer for three days. Prayer doesn't save you because after the prayer, then Ananias comes and talks to Paul and then baptizes him. And now Paul's a Christian. But for three days, you know what was running through Paul's mind. So this trip across town for this blind man, what's running through his mind? His, he's talking to God like nobody's business. And when he opens up, when he washes his face, wow. And he goes right back to the neighborhood. He must have gone back looking for Christ, right? Because verse 8, then, then the neighbors, because he came back. Right. And the neighbors now the neighbors, you know, I'm not sure if they're looking down at him or they're just. 
But this says a lot about the neighbors because they, they saw him as a, you know, and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, is this, is this not the guy who used to sit and beg? And some were saying, this is he, and some were saying, no, he is like him. But he kept saying, I'm the one. It, it's like, it's kind of like what we're guilty of. Because this guy would beg at the same place all the time. And they kept passing him by. And now that he can see, this, the sad thing is they don't even recognize him. And he used to sit on the same corner. They can't even recognize him because they're just constantly ignoring him. Just like the rich man with Lazarus, who was sitting on his steps, totally ignoring him, just going right on by. So I don't know what kind of commentary this says about these people. But it's like they could care less about him. So it is looking down. Right? Your parents were sinners. You deserve what you got. We're just you know, karma, you deserve what you got in the next life, you know, reincarnation, foolish thoughts, foolish teachings. What Jesus is saying is, you're here to help. You're not here to excuse, you're not here to write off, you're not here to tear down, you're here to help. And these guys could care less. And they were saying, well, how did your eyes get opened? You know, oh, well, look, he can see me. Ha, he can see me. So I better now get into the conversation, right? Because when he was blind, I could just. The man who was called Jesus. That's another. The man who was called Jesus. What a way to. Jesus. No, no. The man who was called Jesus. Made clay anointed my eyes, didn't say spit, made clay, anointed my eyes and said, go wash. I went away, washed, and I received sight. And they, where is he? And he says, I don't know. He keeps it simple. But this is the first of his testimonies. Testimony is really important. You know, you want to testify. People are going to see you. This difference in your life because you used to come out drinking with us. You used to go partying. You used to be an angry person. You used to be, but now you've changed. How, how did all this happen? The man who was called Jesus told me to go wash in the waters of baptism. And that's what changed me. Can you explain how this took place? No, I can't explain how my sins were forgiven. He can't explain how he got his sight. All he can say is, he told me what to do, and I did it. There's your testimony. And that's what changes you. And that's what can change everybody in this world. Simple obedience. But they can't handle it. They don't understand. So let's take him to the Pharisees. Okay, so they bring him to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees look, look up to Christ, and they want to destroy him. But they're looking down at this guy, right? And, and they said to him, verse 50, they said, w what happened? He said, I, I, he applied clay to my eyes. I washed, I see. Well, what more is there? I see. And what was it? Clay, that's it. And the Pharisees were saying, verse 16, this, this man's not from God. He, he does, does not keep the Sabbath. Now they're into the teardown. And others say, well, how can a man who is a sinner, they all agree he's a sinner, perform such signs? And there was division among them. And they said to him, well, what about you? Who do you say he is? And he says simply, well, he, he's a prophet. That's my solution. He's done miracle. He's a prophet. Well, pff, we're not listening to you, you know? So what do they do? They call the parents because they don't believe this guy was blind because they cannot accept that Jesus would do such a miracle. They cannot accept. They have such envy. We can't accept this. So we need to tear this guy down. We can't glorify God and say, oh, what wonderful works. Isn't that what Jesus said in, in Matthew? Yeah, right? I should be able to quote it, but I can't. Well, how sad is that? I don't know. But he said, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. And these guys totally refuse to glorify God. And they've seen the works. 
because they don't want to help build people up. They want to tear down. And what about us? Are we really happy when we see good works happening? If somebody's doing it, do we talk positive or do we tear down? Well, as parents prove that, yes, he was blind, but they're not going to say anything because you're going to throw us out of the synagogue. So they don't say anything else. We don't know how he got his sight. And then a second time they call him back, verse 24, who had been blind and said, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. <laughs> you know, give glory to God. But guess what? This guy's a sinner and you better can confer with us. Right. And this is the important thing. Are you prepared to give your testimony? Does your testimony have to be anything extravagant? Absolutely not. But when people are approaching you and saying, hey, why are you so different? And, and am I different? Do they notice that I'm different at work? Do, th do they notice that I'm, I'm, I'm different when I'm out with people? Or do I, like, the, like children, we had our... Uh, what do you call it? Our, we, your, your language. We had a language when we were at home and we had a language we were on the street. We had two different languages. We knew what not to say with our parents, but we knew how to talk with the friends. Do I have two languages? I know what to say when I'm talking to my church friends and when I'm in church, or do I have a different language when I'm in the world? Does the world see me different or have I blended in so I don't look different? So do they even care about my testimony? I'm just like them. Interesting thought. So they said to him, oh, what did he do? How did he open your eyes? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Verse 25, the, the blind man says, whether he is a sinner, I don't know. Don't try to feed me. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. One thing I do know, I was lost in sin, but now I'm walking in eternal life. Well, how do you do it? How do you open it? Look, I already told you. I love how he, right? He's not being complicated. I already told you. You didn't listen. And how much do we listen to other people? Why do you, why do you want to hear it again? You, you do not want to become his disciples, do you? Now, it, you may say this is sick humor or whatever, but no. There's a... Brother Ugo, I, I'm not sure if he's here this morning, but I'll embarrass him. Ugo has got a really neat way of talking like this. He'll just put it in really simple terms that embarrass me when he responds to me and sometimes... And I just go, wow, you know, because I, I have a thing. North Americans have a thing about couching stuff and, and, and we, we dress up responses. And Ugo just cuts to the chase, just say, says it like it is. That's what this guy does right here. Keep it nice and simple. Well, do you want to become one of his disciples? Do you? You know, it's a simple statement. If you're really studying hard, hey. And then they take it. Huh. You are his disciple. We're disciples of Moses. We know God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we don't know. What are you doing? You're tearing down, right? And his response, well, hey, it's an amazing thing that you do not know where he is from. Yet, he opened my eyes. We know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. This is a beggar from birth. He spent his entire life. He's not educated. But with God working in his life, he reasons beautifully, purely. He's brilliant. Don't be looking at street people thinking they're idiots. There's a reason that they got there. 
not ours to worry about. But if we have an opportunity to help them get out, then we need to take their hand and help them get out by helping them find Christ. But I remember Brian Curran, you know, lost in the world of drugs, grew up doing drugs, but he had a, a brilliance to him. Street brilliance, street smarts, that was just, that could cut through to the chase, right? And leave you feeling guilty for saying what you said or thinking what you thought when he could just, don't put people down and don't tear people down, respect them and look straight across and reach out with your hand. 34, ah, you're born in, see? You're born entirely in sin and you're teaching us, out he goes. Yeah, I can write off anybody, right? You're a sinner, goodbye. Christ is saying, well, then help. Don't condemn. Jesus heard that they threw him out and he says, found him and said, do you believe in the son of man? Who is he that, that I may believe him? You know, okay, put yourself in this guy's shoe. Who is he? You know, he's just staring right at Jesus, right? Who is he? Master that I may believe. And I love Jesus' response, you know, you have both seen him. When did I see him? And he is the one who is talking with you. Whoa, hit me with a pound of bricks, right? Like sack of bricks, like just, well, he did. Because the guy, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped. Worship means what? Boom. Worship means face plant. Face plant, which D accidentally took outside the church building because I left something that kind of tripped her up and I feel really bad, but keep praying for D because she got her face, boom, did a face plant. But to see him and then all of a sudden, wow, does he want? Yes. And then for judgment, Jesus says, I came into the world so that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Well, we're not blind, are we, said the Pharisees? Well, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. Because too many people can't accept the idea that they're a sinner can't accept that they don't have a relationship with God or can't accept the fact that God is real and that they can't accept eternal life. Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse 11. And therefore they have their system hooked up and they know how to work it. If somebody is better, greater, and you're envious, you tear them down. You start to shoot down the messenger and you don't listen to the message. And if somebody is there in need of your help, well, you just write him off. Why? Because he's a sinner, because he deserves, and you just walk on by. Never taking the time to look across, because you got to think about this. When you're looking across, there's a chasm between me and that other person. There is a chasm, but I can help them get over that chasm now because I'm in the day and my light shining. And with Christ, I can help them before the night comes and they can't cross the chasm and I can't help them. So when you look at people, don't look up, don't look down, look them in the eye and reach out. And you're the one person, the one person in their life that has an opportunity to help them across the chasm. That's what God is calling us to consider in John chapter 9. How are you going to treat people from now on? That's our lesson. Thank you.